Hello everyone, um, thanks so much for joining us this evening. Uh, a special thanks to Miguel Tamman and Hunter Jutes. This evening is to celebrate the publication of Closeness by Miguel Tamman, uh, which I'll hold up. Yeah. Um, it is the fourth essay in Juxta Press's series, Thoughts One Can't Do Without. Thoughts One Can't Do Without invites authors to share the thoughts that anchor, shape and guide their lives whether it's a one-time epiphany or a closely held mantra, or as in Miguel Tamman's case, the desire for closeness. It is, to quote Tamman himself, a plea for the importance of closeness in art. Tamman's book takes a fresh look at some widely held but unexamined beliefs. It is a questioning, lively and intelligent work which uncovers basic assumptions about what it means to encounter an artwork by way of examples such as the city of Naples, and Alfred Hitchcock's Rear Window. Tamman's characteristic style handles weighty problems with ease. Horace, Bertrand Russell, Moretti and Lichtenstein are all at play in this plea for a renewed understanding of closeness and its importance. It is now my great pleasure to introduce Miguel Tamman and Hunter Duke. Miguel Tamman is Professor of Literary Theory at the University of Lisbon and currently Dean of its School of Arts and Humanities. He was a regular visiting professor at the University of Chicago, a senior fellow at the Stanford Humanities Center and at the National Humanities Center. He has published nine books, including Friends of Interpretable Objects, which I highly, highly recommend, and What Art is Like in constant reference to the Alice, Alice books. Hunter Dukes is university lecturer in English literature at Tampa, Tampa, Tampere, but Tampere yes, University in Finland and a former research fellow at Peterhouse Cambridge. His first book, Signature, came out with Bloomsbury's Object Lesson series in 2020. He is a contributing editor at the Public Domain Review. After this discussion, there will be a short Q&A, so please feel free to write your questions into the little box and all attendees get 15% off the thought series the discount code will be in the chat box and we'll email it to you so afterwards. So welcome, Megan Hunter, and I'll, um, I'll hand over to you now. Great. Thank you very much, Octavia. Um, Miguel, would you like to say anything before we begin? Oh, no. Why, why don't we just begin? <laughs> OK, I, I, I agree. I think that is best. Um, so this is going to last for, for 35 to 40 minutes. We're going to, we've talked before about keeping it somewhat conversational. Um, I don't want to just berate Miguel with questions. Um, and then there'll be a Q&A. So, so do you note down anything you want to follow up on? Um, so this is the book, Closeness, and it's composed almost, I think, as a diptych or, or two essays that are in conversation um, with each other. And they're united by this term, closeness, of course. So I thought as a plea for closeness, um, as an argument against those who decry closeness, we could kind of begin by just thinking about this term and what it means for you. Well, it's, it's, um, it, it's actually easier to define closeness if you understand the arguments against closeness. Um, um, closeness means what closeness means. That I have no, no special um, theoretical juices uh, injected into the term, um, but uh, three kinds of arguments against closeness and actually closeness in art. The first being, well, I suppose, what we could call an epistemic argument, uh, which is the notion that uh, closeness doesn't yield or add to any knowledge. So there is no necessary connection between being close to something and knowing anything about that thing. So this is an epistemic argument. <laughs> then there's a second argument, which for lack of a better term, I suppose we could call a political argument, which suggests that the closer you are to an artwork, the further away you become from say the big picture. And so ultimately you don't see what really matters. And, for the um, uh, for the within this political argument, of course, what really matters is the big picture, and so closeness is a distraction. And then there's a third argument, which I suppose we could call a practical argument or a psychological argument, uh, 
uh, that suggests that closeness is ultimately an unattainable ideal because uh, for psychological reasons or perhaps practical reasons, you can only pay close attention to so many things. And so uh, you cannot live by closeness, as it were. Okay, great. So we have three strands there. And, and you say in your argument too that you're, the approach you take is neither sociological uh, nor psychological. And that's kind of an important idea, I think, that recurs. Um, so maybe you could outline in some detail what your path forward is or how you respond to these, these this epistemic, political, and this well, larger. Of these three arguments, I tend to agree with the epistemic argument. It is, I tend to agree with the argument according to which closeness yields no uh, particular or special kind of knowledge. But I also acknowledge that in another sense, closeness is, I suppose you could call it ineliminable. Um, and this has to do with spatial proximity and effective investment and whatnot. So the relevance of art for us is measured by the contiguity between what counts as art and our other activities and customs and not by what we say about art in general or, about our, or, or by our theories about art. So there's a sense in which you can't get rid of closeness. Mm. And this is what interests me. Yes, I, I think throughout the piece or throughout your book, you say that you can't, you have to kind of live with closeness because you can't, you can't do it out of you. You have to make do with it because you can't get away from it in a sense. Um, and you, you mentioned these two kind of senses, which I, I think are very um, elegant in a way and, and pull out the, the strangeness of the term and the, the sense that it can be something effective almost, or it can be how closely we live alongside art objects, um, how, how much they inform us, but also kind of the literal distance at which we, we stand from a painting or how closely and how slowly um, we read a poem. And I think, from my understanding, this connects the last point of what you said um, just now is that it connects to the idea of what it means to be an artistic person or what it means to, to lead an artistic life um, in a way. And you, you have this line, I believe, about um, when well, artistic life is just some, some life that art objects are attached to. Um, I'm, I'm not putting it as well as you put it, um, but it's not, it's not based necessarily on some sort of faculty that one person may have or some sort of ses sensitivity um, ability to bring themselves close to, to a piece of art, but rather it's just a question of attachment. Um, since that was kind of one of the topics that framed in the ad advertisement for our conversation tonight, I thought we might bring that in. Yeah, well, uh, that's, that's, that's actually a, a crucial uh, point for me. Um, in order for us to describe the role of art, um, uh, you have, and this is the uncontroversial part of my claim, in order for us to describe the role of art, you have to describe practices, that is, things we do. Um, now, to that I add that for us to describe practices in the case of art, you have to describe lives, that is, you have to describe certain kinds of lives, um, not just lives in, uh, uh, lives, uh, lives in general, but particular lives where what counts as art is terribly close to the person, <laughs> you see. Um, so uh, in a sense, um, um, you tend to be, if you're an artistic person, whatever that means, you tend to surround yourself with art, it, whatever, this, whatever it means. So. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and this surrounding is very interesting. Um, in, in the preface to this book, it's, it's framed by an encounter with Wallace Stevens' uh, Anecdote of the Jar, um, which is a wonderful poem, a poem that's long fascinated me. Um, and it's a poem, in some sense, I think, that, that presents a jar in Tennessee, uh, a container that we're looking outwards onto. Uh, and then at the end of the poem, there's this strange reversal, in a sense, where this jar is not necessarily kind of an enclosure on its own, but it's actually enclosing everything that's taking place in our encounter. Um, its dominion extends outwards in a sense. So maybe we could talk just a bit more about this idea of being surrounded by art, surrounding oneself with art, because um, I know it has some, some nuance in your argument and it's distinct from closeness. Um, yeah, indeed. Um, well, um, this being surrounded by art or this feeling that to, to, to quote from Stevens, this feeling that something has taken dominion um, um, 
is a little different from paying close attention to art. Um, it's a little bit like when you realize that you had walked into another country unawares or, or into a nude beach. Um, <laughs> Um, it may happen by chance, and, and you may realize it only after the fact. So, more often than not, is it's not part of a plan. Um, uh, but then things get a little bit more complicated because only a certain, um, only only a certain kind of person would realize that. Only a certain kind of person would realize that he or she has walked into another country, say, uh, or, or, or whatnot. And perhaps that would only happen to, to a certain kind of person. Um, um, the, say, to realize that one is suddenly surrounded by another country, you need to know lots of other things and, and be a certain kind of person and whatnot. Not to mention uh, 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 the sense that one has walked and wears into a nude beach. Um, uh, this is the sort of thing that only happens to certain kinds of people, <laughs> you see. Yes. So, yeah, the, uh, it reminds me of the example you give, um, well, two examples you give, the, the kind of recurrent example of Naples, which we should talk about, which is fascinating. Um, mm -hmm. Being being right about Naples and not ever having been there or surrounding oneself by representations of Naples versus actually visiting the place itself. Um, but also this question of choreography and, and an artistic life choreography. And the example I believe you give is kind of stumbling into a mu museum, as you say, unaware. Um, and having some sort of significant encounter versus being perhaps aware that you are in proximity to a museum and the kind of, kind of it's, a, it's a loop of self-awareness or something like that happens in that moment seems mm -hmm. particularly vested. So, so perhaps mm -hmm. um, first we could think um, about this museum example and then Naples. Well, 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 um... The, the, well, there, there are some practical differences. I mean, uh, usually access to museums is more restricted than access to, to cities. And, and, and so the idea of uh, walking into a museum, uh, a museum unawares is perhaps less plausible than the idea of suddenly finding yourself surrounded with Naples or whatnot. This, uh, this often happens with public monuments or architecture, say, forms of, of more public art, as it were, where, 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 where you don't actually have to buy a ticket. Um, um, uh, still, I'm, uh, there's, there's another case, say, um, um, uh, someone, someone is in Naples and, and, I don't know, wants to have lunch and, 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 and decides to, uh, assumes rightly that at this particular museum there, is, there must be a cafeteria. And so would look for cafeterias in museums as opposed to uh, pizza parlors or wherever. Um, and, and this suggests that um, uh, uh, this suggests that certain expectations are connected to certain places. And so it would suggest that in a certain way, art is um, part of that person's life in a funny way. Um, <clears throat> very mediated and complex, I think. I, I just have to ask because we're on the topic and I'm sure other readers of your book will ask, uh, is there a particular reason that Naples plays such a, such a prominent role here? Um, to think well, with? yes, yes. And it, it's actually very interesting. I've never been to Naples. <laughs> 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 well, this is one of the wonderful counter arguments that you kind of raise to um, many of us, I think, in the audience who are kind of, if you encounter art objects or encounter criticism around art objects, there is a really um, a line that you meet time and again that, that uh, we should slow down around them, that we should spend time in proximity to them, that this will allow us to say something truer about the object. But you raise a wonderful point that about pleasure, or about the hypothetical that perhaps being very far away from a novel um, and not reading it closely at all could, could grant one the most pleasure um, or allow a certain form of access that 
that closeness excludes. Um, well, 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 in these, um, what I was saying earlier about the, the epistemic argument uh, completely applies to this situation. The fact that you can say meaningful things about Naples is, I mean, uh, the, uh, the fact that you, uh, that you can say meaningful things about Naples does not, or that you can say meaningful things about Naples does not require that you have been there. Um, um, there's, there's uh, um, with art often, I mean, most often, there's nothing like what we could call a native relationship to certain, to certain objects that will entitle you epistemically, as it were, to, to bona fide say things about those objects. Uh, this says, this says, now this is an argument against the epistemic privilege of closeness, but is not an argument against closeness, qua closeness. Uh, so so well, it's perfectly possible for me to describe closeness in relation to Naples and never having been to Naples. It's it's actually very trivial. Well, historians do it all the time, after all, because of course they're, they're, uh, uh, no one has ever been to, no one alive, that is, has ever been to Cleopatra's Egypt, Egypt, or, or, or you know, Fred Flintstone's uh, times or whatnot. Um, so the, the idea of a direct contact, and it's also, also, it's also possible um, for somebody to have had direct access or direct contact with a certain kind of object. This uh, often happens with events and, and, and uh, not be aware or, 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 or not be able to say anything interesting or particularly illuminating about what he or she has just witnessed. And it happens, you know, very often. There's a, there's a you know, classic example which is uh, this, this entry from uh, Louis XVI's journal for, for July 14, 1789. So that's the day when officially the French Revolution started. And, and what he wrote in his journals was simply rien, nothing. <laughs> um, well, he was there. He was surrounded by the French Revolution and he didn't know anything. It was not because he was stupid. It was perhaps because he was doing other things. Um, mm. uh, so the fact that you've actually been there, uh, not everyone who has been to Naples understands whatever there is to understand about, about Naples. This is very interesting. I think this is a very interesting paradox. This is an effect of this general epistemic condition. Yeah, it's absolutely fascinating. Um, in the book, you you kind of usefully employ Bertrand Russell's um, distinction between, I think this is kind of what we're alluding to here, is knowledge by description versus knowledge by acquaintance. Mm -hmm. um, but before all of that, uh, I think one of my favorite parts of the book is going all the way back to Horace and Ars Poetica and, and disentangling this, this kind of very tricky line of thought about closeness um, mm -hmm. and distance. So I, I want to talk a little bit about that, but I also maybe this gets us to something we've discussed previously, um, the question of ekphrasis or the kind of the lovely aspect of your thought that it doesn't necessarily want to just be about poetics or just be about aesthetics or speaking of paintings. You're kind of opening this to talking about Naples as well or anything we want to describe as art um, falls within your purview. And I think part of that is inherited from Horace because of this funny thing that happens um, between calling a painting and poet, calling a painting and a poem, um, not equal, you're careful to say, but Horace says that standing at a distance from both or standing close to either might in some way be related, I believe. Well, well, Horace is actually making a very simple, a very interesting point and a point that is usually uh, misunderstood. I mean, this is the famous Horatian tag, Ut Pictura Poesis. Uh, which is translated as, uh, you know, poetry is just like painting, or poetry is just like a picture. Um, um, uh, but this is not what Horace meant by it. He's actually describing, he, he, he goes on after saying, you know, ut pictura poesis. He goes on and, and, and adds that uh, poems are just like paintings in the sense that some poems um, uh, gain from being examined at 
close range, whereas other poems uh, should be seen from afar or looked at from a certain um, distance. And so he's actually making this very interesting distinction. He's not talking about poetry as a genre. This is, he's talking about kinds of poems. You know, certain, certain poems, uh, certain poems you really have to get close to, whereas certain other poems uh, you needn't or you shouldn't perhaps see. Um, and so there's no general rule of closeness for art. So closeness is not an imperative. Um, um, uh, um, uh, I wouldn't feel comfortable with, say, a maxim such as always get close to your objects of choice. Um, more often than not, or perhaps at least some of the time you should. Yeah. Mm. So, so this is the Horatian thing. And this is a very interesting empirical dis description, which I, which I find very, very true. Um, and, and this also applies to, to cities. And the, the, beauty, the beauty of it, uh, actually, is that this is about poems, but it's not just about poems, it's actually about everything. It applies to cities, it definitely applies to people. I mean, this, this typical moral empirical distinction that I'm sure everybody can easily recognize that some people actually, you, sh you shouldn't get too close to, to some people, not because they'll hurt you, but because your opinion of them will, will change in unfavorable ways. I mean, he's the sort of person or she's the sort of person that um, is better seen from afar. Um, um, whereas conversely, uh, we have the case of those people uh, whom we insist should be known um, in a very proximate, close, way because um what you see is actually not what you get as it were mm. yeah absolutely i i don't want to lead us astray uh, but this has just popped into my mind in your descriptions and i think it is it feels to be in the background um of your book in a sense that your claim that um pleas of closeness or descriptions of closeness are often uh masquerade as descriptions about the kind of life a person should lead um, similarly, what you're talking about here, right, that there's maybe a certain kind of person we don't want to get too close to that are, it would be better to see from afar. I mean, this is, I don't want to say a moral imperative, but this seems to be nested in with um, something almost ethical or a, a, a way to be either around art objects or a way to be full stop. Um, but I, I'm not, I don't want to put words where there aren't words. So do correct me if I'm wrong. No, no, it's, um, the thing is, um, uh, uh, there is no, uh, um, I mean, if we assume that there is no, 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 no closeness principle, this means that the distinction between those art objects that you want to get close to and those that you don't is a purely empirical distinction. And, mm -hmm. and, and the kind of knowledge that is required to make those distinctions, those sometimes they're very, you know, difficult calls, uh, um, uh, is, uh, I suppose, what you would call your experience of art. I mean, you know that certain things are better not um, examined, that or you shouldn't over-interpret certain things. Um, 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 uh, I, Richards, uh, famously argues that uh, a very good poem always invites close reading. This is what he said in Practical Criticism, I believe. Uh, now, um, not necessarily, not necessarily. Some absolutely great poems do not invite close reading. It depends. You have this wonderful hypothetical of Horace meeting I.A. Richards uh, and Franco Moretti as well, uh, champions mm -hmm. of close versus distant reading. Um, and I don't want to, to disciplinize this conversation too much, but I mean, this is this seems to be um, in many ways intervention into questions in uh, literary studies and, and beyond about the stakes or the efficacy of close or distant reading. I mean, these, have, this is, these terms have been thrown about um, very much in the last decade, we have we have a turn to, to surface reading now as well, and and post critique um, 
right? re-inviting certain effective modes into our reading. So I don't know if you, you argue a line in this regard, but I'm from your citations and from well, your well, argument, well, I know this is very clear. Well, I have a few arguments about that. Um, well, but first, some of these um, terminological innovations, as it were, are explained not so much by a genuine philosophical or, or intellectual impulse, but simply by certain amount of anxiety about the next big thing, which is very constitutive of literary studies. And so in a way, you have to generate um, terminological terminological um, special effects and you do it every once in a while and so you come up with uh, schools and tags and whatnot. Still, uh, 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 Moretti, who tellingly enough has collected uh, uh, some of his uh, more influential essays in the, under the title Distant Reading, um, uh, believes that, uh, I mean, his essentially talking about novels, right? And, and, and he believes that since no one can read everything, then there's no point in reading anything, which uh, uh, strikes me as, 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 as a classic baby and bathwater confusion. Um, I tend to think that paying attention to certain things does not prevent you from making general statements. So you can talk about a novel in general, even if you've only read 47 novels. And if I'm right, even if you haven't read any novel, uh, uh, that does not prevent you from going from particular to, to, to general. So let's say that Moretti is um, uh, a skeptic about inference, an example, and I am not. He believes that since nobody can humanly read everything that has been written, all talk about generality should uh, avoid uh, 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 reading. And so you basically talk about novels. Um, you, 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 you unapologetically should talk about novels without having read them. Um, uh, this is nonsense, honestly. Uh, <laughs> because it's, it, it, it's not the fact that, say, an entomologist has seen every uh, living token of the species be that she can't say anything meaningful, meaningful about, uh, about bees. So it's a problem of inference, as it were. Mm. Um, I suppose a, a, more, a more prudent version of his argument would be, and he sometimes makes it, but then he gets carried away. Uh, 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 a more prudent version of the argument would be to say that in order for us to say certain things about novels, uh, no actual reading of those novels is required. And that is true, but trivial, I think. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, well, this, I mean, I'm going off of just, there's so many things I want to go off of from what you just said. Um, I guess but to start, and I think it touches on um, Moretti and this this claim that you describe, right? That we can't we can't read everything, um, so we have to read at a, a great distance, um, and that can be so intimidating. I know as as a teacher, and I think you know as well uh, for students. And very poignantly, I think you you end um, your your book on this note of this idea of technical language, um, which you started that previous response thinking about, right? About the next big thing turning towards a uh, specific terminology in order to, to generate a new research field and how, I mean, frankly, intimidating um, or sometimes disheartening that can be for students who come in with certain experiences about novels or works of art uh, and then have those experiences kind of shoved or translated into a terminology that might not be the best at representing them. Um, and there's, so there's something very liberating, I think, um, and exciting for a student encountering this claim that one doesn't have to read every novel in order to be able to speak about novels. One can speak about novels having only read a few, if, if any at all. It reminds me of, of a previous work of yours, what artists like um, and how you 
you advance a, a system of principles about what art is like, making constant reference to to the Alice books, um, which is which is lovely. But is this a is this a this is a continued preoccupation for you, obviously. Um, and I just wondered if we could talk a little bit more about this kind of turn away from technical terminology and how, how it relates to closeness here. Well, um, uh, yeah, that's, uh, I mean, um, uh, two things or two distinctions. Well, the fact you can, you, you can sometimes be clear about things without having to introduce much technical terminology. That's the first thing. And sometimes you have to introduce, technical terminology is a little bit like neologisms. You should use it sparingly. Um, uh, however, in, in certain familiar contexts or certain, certain contexts that are clearly familiar to most of us, here I'm assuming, but it's not unreasonable. Uh, technical terminology is used as a protective mechanism, as well, as a way of uh, um, separating out those uh, within and those without. It's it's also it's also a um, uh, funny combination of propitiatory ritual and Masonic handshake, uh, where where where. Uh, uh, um, if you master that terminology, then you're automatically believed to be one of us or one of them. Uh, uh, um, and so this is this is a general point about technical terminology. Uh, this says uh, I tend to I tend to think that in order to I mean. You know, I'm a teacher, so I have to teach stuff, uh, mostly texts. And in order for one to explain certain points about text, um, it's usually more useful not to confuse things by introducing um, a thick layer of opaque terminology, but rather exercise those very basic abilities of comparison and 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 and, 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 um, and this is this is this is an old Aristotelian point. It's it's you 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 you, uh, you know new things in relation to things you already knew. So comparison is is here crucial. And this is actually why metaphor is so crucial. Um, Aristotle, of course, had a similar theory for metaphor and knowledge. For Aristotle, are pretty much the same thing. You find you find equivalence, and and, and it's a it's sort of a trial and error sort of thing. And, and in a classroom, I find myself increasingly doing that. I mean, it's, it's, it's usually counterproductive um, to merely introduce this thick layer of terminology and then um, have them, uh, almost like a military drill, uh, have them practice this new, newly acquired terminology. And, and then what you say, well, uh, go out in the world and apply it? Uh, it's, not, it's, it's not how it works. Um, it's not how it works. Um, so, so, so this is why I'm so wary of, of, of overly technical terminology. This doesn't mean that I don't use it. It means that I don't use it very often. <laughs> First, yes, I, I completely agree with that sentiment. Um, Perhaps tangenting or um, going off of your idea of the, the importance of juxtaposition from Aristotle, but there's a there's a wonderful um, toward the end of your book an extended kind of reading of um, a piece of technical terminology you perhaps introduced in a in a very whimsical way um, the rear window position um, yeah. from Hitchcock and you're talking about comparison in a sense because it's about trying to arrive on either a description of what witness. So I mean, we've talked about Wallace Stevens, but I wanted to perhaps open our discussion too to the, the other objects that inform this book, um, because it's a it's a wonderful collection. Um, so either Rear Window specifically, or or why why you've seized upon this film? Well, 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 the Rear Window position first, perhaps. Uh, well, I'm 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 of course alluding to to Hitchcock's wonderful movie where. 
which which describes the position of a um, um, paralyzed photographer uh, speculating about the contents of a box or about what takes place in an apartment across um, 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 across the I mean there's a there's a little garden there's a there's a yard sort of um, um, and and uh, and and, uh, uh, and and you ask yourself questions and 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 and, and the, the the photographer who's always watching um, is uh, at least twice asked uh, an important question is it right for one to peer into other people's lives and is it right for one to be so absurdly close to something that ultimately was none of his business now the rear window position is of course the position of somebody who was actually um it's it's a little bit to another another film reference uh, it's a it's a peeping tom position um uh, it's a peeping tom position and when you call it a peeping tom uh, uh, of course, all, all sorts of ethical questions immediately uh, come to to surface. So, is it is it right for one to want to be very close to things which are ultimately none of one's business? Um, now, uh, two things I want to say. Um, the first is is actually a, a sequence. Uh, of my previous epistemic point. Uh, the fact that Jimmy Stewart and then Grace Kelly in, in Hitchcock's movie uh, are obsessed with what's taking place on that other apartment and the fact that they're watching everything all the time does not necessarily yield any added knowledge. And, and there's this wonderful moment there's this wonderful moment in the movie where uh, he is, has this, these binoculars uh, and he's looking at something and then he passes the binoculars to Grace Kelly and, and says something to the effect, are you seeing what, you, what I see? Are you seeing what I saw? Now tell me what it means. Now uh, what? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm quoting from memory, but, but Jimmy Stewart's point is that uh, perception uh, is different from meaning and perception does not in and by itself carry any meaning. So even the fact that you're constantly looking into your neighbor's apartment does not provide any added knowledge. So this is an argument against closeness. This is an argument against closeness. Now the second thing I want to say is, is um, it's, it's really about this rear window position. I mean in, in uh, normal legal or, or even moral conversations there are lots, uh, lots of problems with this kind of position. It's, it's, it's often illegal even to, to do those things, to you know stalking or or, or taking unwanted pictures or, or not. Um, and which suggests that, of course, there are many contexts in which you aren't allowed to get close to certain things or certain people, like, you know, uh, court injunctions by judges that uh, may uh, uh, forbid you from getting within a certain distance from a certain person or whatnot. We're all familiar with, with, with that. Now, in matters of art, however, the official version is very different, is that it is absolutely all right to be perpetually in a rear window position, to, to obsess about what is taking place in your neighbor's apartment, to look really closely into the text, to, to, to be the perpetual Jimmy Stewart uh, of, 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 say, literary studies or art studies or whatnot. You have to really look very close. What about, um, um, if Horace is, is, is correct, however, 
um, the rear window position is not an imperative and should, and there are cases when it is, where it's justified or fully justified, whereas there are other circumstances where it's totally unwarranted and you shouldn't. Um, but of course, who's to make the distinction? There are no laws. So, 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 so the distinction is a practical empirical distinction. And this is what I was saying earlier about experience. I don't know if I... Absolutely, I mean, that's one of the... Uh, yeah, no, 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 I'm, I'm following you exactly. Um, th that's a point that really struck, struck me and stuck with me, um, is the idea that we have immediate instincts about um, how close we should be to a neighbor's apartment, if we should look inside or not. And then we ask the same question of how close should we be to, to novels? How much time should we spend rereading them? And that kind of, we, we think to ourselves, perhaps the, the more the better, um, which is very strange. And you, you untangle in all sorts of interesting ways. Um, I'm conscious of the time, and I want to make sure there's enough time for question and answers, but perhaps just because um, I promised to ask this, I'll ask one last short question um, before we, we turn outward. And that's just the, the question of, of time, um, as we're running out of time. Um, <laughs> and I'm thinking of time as a form of closeness. Um, we talked a little bit about TJ Clark, right, visiting a painting over and over and over again. But I just wanted to maybe on as a last note to finish here to think about biographically or how this book came to be, because I know that um, at least one of part of this book was a, a lecture that's been given a long time ago and revised and thought about and these are questions you've been considering for, for a very long time and you've been living alongside of and close to perhaps for a very long time so perhaps we can <laughs> speak about that briefly well, and then we'll we'll see what other people have to say well i don't know if i'm a slow reader but i'm definitely a slow writer uh, yeah, um uh, well two things i uh, i suppose we could say about time well first is that paying close attention to say a book or or, or, or picture or, or whatnot requires time and time requires certain habits and certain practices. Um, and even in some cases certain that certain institutions are in place. Universities are wonderful institutions, um, especially because they give you the time to do certain things that most people, most other people can't afford. Um, and so you have time to do certain things. I mean, nobody reads novels like us i mean in a seminar room or a classroom i mean because i mean what what you call reading a novel is not doing to that doing to that novel the, the sorts of uh intricate things we do in you know in classrooms so and that requires you know that requires time this is the first this is the first thing i want to say about time oh, now second thing is is or oh, it's more in a sense, perhaps a little more personal. I mean, these these ideas. I suppose this is totally trivial, so I'm sure it will be disappointing. Uh, uh, <laughs> these ideas certainly, to me, they take a long time to to mature. Um, they 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 don't or rarely come fully formed like Athena out of Zeus's head. Um, um, and this is why the, the various contingencies of my profession tend to be very helpful, because there are all sorts of unexpected things. I mean, invitations or, 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 or commissioned essays, things that you never thought you, you, you'd like to write about. And, and then perhaps you're out of weakness, you end up accepting doing those things and and it's never a waste of time and 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 very often the time it's uh um, i still don't understand it very well uh you may be writing an essay about stevens and and having a a wonderful idea about wittgenstein that has nothing to do with 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 Stevens and, and these things happen in, in totally un, unforeseen and un, unexpected, unexpected ways. And what, what often happens, and this is the case of the, the two chapters of this book is that um, they were both lectures originally. And, and what often happens to lectures is that you give the lecture and you take notes and you realize certainly after the Q and A's that certain things didn't didn't work that well, and then you 
you know, think a little bit and, 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 and adjust the lecture and then suddenly it becomes something else. And, that, and, and then of course, you also have this powerful recycling impulse. And so you use the lecture for different purposes. And then 10 years later, you have a chapter. Um, um, and, 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 and so these two chapters were originally lectures. Actually, the, 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 the first chapter, the first chapter was given out as a lecture for the first time, I think in 2003 or 2004, and it had a um, beautiful title, Art, <laughs> a very ambitious title, Art. And, and, it, was, and, it, was, and it was actually, uh, um, it was actually um, um, an attempt to come to terms with Wallace Stevens's poem. Now Wallace Stevens's poem only appears, it's like a, 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 a short cameo appearance, the beginning of the book, but there's no talk of Stevens. It's not a book about Stevens or anything, but it's like a, an homage to, private homage to the prehistory of the book. I don't know. <laughs> That's wonderful. Well, well, thank you so much, Miguel. Um, I'll turn things back over to Octavia now who will facilitate the Q&A. Hi, I really enjoyed that. I'm, I think, yeah, I definitely, I love the idea of it being a matter of having a good practical curiosity and trying things out. And yeah, that's kind of subscribed to that belief very much. Uh, we have one question from Sonia Moore. An old cheater of mine once advised me to spend long hours observing or listening to artworks. I was interested in Miguel not having visited Naples. If we respond to artworks more through descriptions and debates, is there a danger of the artwork itself being lost in the words and not heard? We might respond not to the artwork, but to all the surrounding noise. Hmm. Uh, yes, uh, the, the, the short answer is, is, is yes. But it's also notoriously hard to, to tell surrounding noise from what really matters and um and and there's even an noise to to i mean concentrated attention is not a form of elimination of noise this is a fantasy that by paying very close attention to say a picture you you bracket out eliminate uh, 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 all all noise and distraction it's not uh, it's not the case. So that that sort of distraction can happen uh, uh, both with uh, both with uh, you know um, both with when, both in cases of concentrated attention and uh, cases of of extreme distraction um, or, or 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 so so it's not necessarily related to closeness. I don't think so. Uh, that said, that said, but I, I don't want to dodge the question. Uh, 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 that said, I think it is often a very good idea to pay close attention to certain uh, artworks. For instance, if, if you're reacting to certain distinctions, you need to be able to master those distinctions, and those distinctions can only be mastered through uh, uh, certain forms of attention, and so you end up realizing those. It's, it's like Telling the sound of an oboe from the sound of a clarinet. Um, uh, this is not a, a this 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 is not a, a, this is not a non-empirical problem. Um, uh, 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 and how do you how do you acquire that distinction? I, you know, repeated exercise and, and probably by having uh, uh, listened to or heard in a perhaps even in a contrastive way. Um, uh, clarinet sounds and oboe sounds, things like that, or detecting certain certain elements in the taste of, say, wine or whatnot. You know, raspberry. This wine tastes like raspberry. That is, it's my description of this taste is relative to my description of raspberry, raspberries, and this suggests some some some. Proximity, yes. No, but yeah. 
So it's, it's often a good idea. It's not always a good idea. If, I, I believe Horace is essentially correct about this. Not always a good idea, but it's often a very good idea. Uh, then we have another question from, and I'm really sorry if I pronounce this incorrectly, but Pedro Mexia. Um, I would like to ask about false closeness. Can we understand, say, a song because it's ostensibly about something we've experienced, even if we have, in fact, misheard the lyrics? That's, that's, uh, uh, that's a wonderful case. Yes, yes. Um, uh, uh, let me give you a, 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 a related uh, example. In, in, in Proust's novel, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, his girlfriend just died and he goes away to Venice and then he gets a telegram and when he's reading that telegram he realizes that the telegram is from his dead girlfriend and he immediately builds a wonderful theory on, 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 on his girlfriend, his girlfriend's death, and also the meaning of the telegram. As it happens, it was a, 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 a mistake in transcription at a post office. So, so the, the telegram was not sent by his dead girlfriend. Now, did he understand less the telegram because he got it wrong? I mean, the experience was probably even more intense um, I mean, he, he becomes very disappointed when a little later in the novel he realizes that it wasn't his girlfriend who had actually sent a telegram. Um, and so uh, there's a, an, an intense sense of closeness, and in the sense of the question too, it's false closeness, um, which yields an added sense of understanding and perhaps even intimacy, uh, but is triggered or caused by things that uh, afterwards we realize uh, were, um, by, or by perceptions that we realize were mistaken. Now we can of course correct our perceptions but you can only do it after the fact. And very often correcting perceptions is a way of reacting against this extreme intimacy of closeness. But yes, you can, you can give, you know, huge meaning, say, uh, even deep existential meaning to a song and, and still uh, 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 and not getting the lyrics right. Um, and it's, 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 like, it's like reading a, te a text in a bad critical edition or a bad transcription. Uh, uh, that happens all the time, yes. Um. I constantly miss your song lyrics, and I often prefer the ones I've invented. So yeah, I like that question. Uh, here's one more from Madalena Alfaya. Can a glimpse of a single feature in a work of art, book or picture or film or music, be the as close as you can get to it? What's the part played by intuition in this approach? Mm. Mm. Um, I, I really don't know how to um, how how to define sufficient conditions for for closeness. I, you know, details definitely details may pay uh, 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 a very very important role. A passing glances or glimpses uh, 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 may be uh, very important. Um, uh, I, I detect in the question a certain skeptical or pessimistic strand, which is you're never going to get the real thing or the whole thing. So you, you, you must, um, you know, satisfy yourself with, you know, partial uh, perceptions of an object. Not necessarily so. For, for uh, the, the test for a perception, it, it, it's, it's strangely irrelevant that the perception is a partial perception. Uh, uh, um, the, 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 uh, what, what, uh, what, what counts as understanding is the ability to describe, to describe a whole object, even if your perception was, you know, very... Uh, very partial. Now, the the part played by intuition in this in this approach. 
uh, part of me wants to say there clearly is something. Uh, but then uh, I want to say that uh, happenstance and serendipity and chance play uh, an equally an equally important role. Say seeing something in a different context. Um, this uh, very often happens with visual works of art or architecture, certainly seeing th things in a certain light, uh, certain um, one-time occurrences that may be um, uh, uh, probably um, unrepeatable uh, occurrences, all sorts of contingent factors. But, but of course, intuition, intuition is important also in the sense that when you know your stuff, you know what to look for. And, and, and you know which details may be relevant. Of course, you have hopes that other people will follow you in your intuitions, but these are only hopes. This is the typical classroom position. I mean, you, you know, very often there's a whole party going on inside of you and, 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 and you can only present it, uh, taking care not to become too over emphatic or or, or extreme and point to certain things. Now, perhaps you should try this thing. Perhaps you should look at this and look, look at that. I mean, you needn't do that, but perhaps you should. And, and then try to describe what happens or try to describe what you see or not. It's, yeah. So, uh, and, and knowing, and, and, and I suppose intuition can, is part of that. Is this clear? I don't know. Yeah, I, yeah. Uh, an intuition that you develop over a long life, maybe. <laughs> um, so we got a question, another one. I was thinking um, the opposite, I suppose, of the previous question. A detail might be the most, oh no, a detail might be the most relevant of it all. But thank you. Um, I get, yeah, perhaps slightly more of a comment. Um, uh, um, well, but, but, but you're right. Uh, the most relevant um, uh, of it all. And it's, uh, and, and very often our, our perception of, and it's not just artworks, it's, it's actions or people or whatnot can be redeemed by a single detail. Oh, yes. And you tend to, um, overlook or even deliberately ignore everything else just to concentrate on that detail. But it's not very different from say, um, uh, I mean, a, a person's life is among many other things, a series of actions. And you may think that one of those actions was particularly important or telling, redeeming in this sense. I don't necessarily mean redeeming in any theological sense. I, I just mean an action that stands out. And that uh, protuberant, outstanding action uh, may, what you want to say is um, when somebody says, well, the person who did X and X is this really outstanding action also did Y and Z. And what you want to say is that Y and Z don't matter. What matters to me is that particular detail. That's what I find uh, meaningful. And this happens with people, um, happens with landscapes, happens with artwork. This happens with actions. Yes, so details can be extremely important in that sense. Good. Um, those are, I think those are all the questions um, that, we, that we have. Um, I want to, if we're happy to wrap up here, I'd like to thank you both so much for this evening. I really enjoyed it and I hope everyone did too. We'll be sending out an email um, tomorrow on the next couple of days with the recorded video as well as the discounted code I spoke about earlier. Um, mm -hmm. On behalf of Chickster Press, just a huge thank you. It's been such a great book to work on. It arrived pretty fully formed, which is always our favourite. <laughs> the 
the best situation to be in. And we just hope it reaches as many readers as possible because it's a real gem. So yeah, thank you. And thank you, Hunter, for such brilliant questions. Of course, my pleasure. Great, all right. And thank you very much. And also to the people who patiently sat through this discussion. Hunter, thank you so much. Octavia, it was, this is a pleasure. It's a really good book though. <laughs> Everyone, I haven't got it. <laughs> All right. Bye. Bye. Good night.